In this video, I would like to introduce you to the Euler's method. Uh, up until this point in the course, we have been solving our kinematics problems and showing them move in GlowScript using an analytical solution. That is, we're using our kinematics equations that we've developed. But if you see in here, there's two balls that are flying through the air, but both of them are achieving the same result. One's just been shifted a little bit to the left, but one is using the analytical method using kinematics equations, and the second one is using the Euler's method to find the new location after each time step. So that's what we're going to be investigating in this video. So I've created a new program here in GlowScript, and I'm going to first start off by really just starting from scratch. Let's just review how we can do projectile motion, how we did it previously. So we're going to first make the background scene all white. So I've added this scene.background equals color.white command. Next, let's create our objects. So in line six, I've created a ball that's uh, blue in color and a radius of 0.2, and it's located negative 15 to the left on the screen. The other ball is located at negative 16, so it's just one unit over. Uh, they're both starting at a zero height. Then I've added a ground, which is just a, simply a box, and it's uh, going to have a width of 40 and a little bit of thickness of 0.1 in vertical height and then it stretches a little bit back at five units. It's green in color. So if I just run the program you should see just the creation of those objects in here. Uh, you can see a blue and a green ball on top of my ground here. Okay so the next thing we're going to need to do is we're going to have to set up some initial conditions like the initial position, the initial velocity, and the acceleration. We're using, first I'm going to remind you, we're just doing the old way of making, say, the first ball move. So instead of uh, essentially doing x0, y0, and z0 in terms of position, I'm going to be defining the initial x, y, and z as a vector quantity. So I'm using ball.pause, not .pause.x or y or z. So we are essentially defining all three of it. So it's really a vector quantity here, and we're going to do the same thing with velocity and acceleration. I decided to give the ball a velocity of 15 meters per second at an angle of 60 degrees above the horizontal. Uh, now remember that computers think in radians, so you need to convert your 60 degrees to radians. I could either multiply by pi and then divide by 180, or there is a function called radians um, that you could just automatically convert it to radians. Right, so the x component of the velocity is going to be 15 times cosine of 60 degrees. The y component is going to be 15 times sine 60 degrees. And we're not having anything along the z-axis. Next, let's define the acceleration. So in this line 13, I'm choosing no acceleration horizontally, but there is a vertical acceleration of negative 9.8, and we don't have any acceleration along the z-axis. And if you recall, we would also have to initialize the time. So I'll just put t equals 0 here. And also the time step, we'll put dt as 0 0.01 seconds. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is basically we need to make the objects move. Okay, so we're going to have to create um, a loop in order for them to move. And we're going to be using a while loop. So we're going to use uh, a while uh, ball.pause.y, because we only want the y-axis, that is greater than or equal to 0. And we'll use colon. So now we're going to, in this block of code that we're going to about to write here, is going to be uh, what we're going to be performing in every iteration here. So first we'll need to add a rate command. That's going to be basically the inverse of our increment of time. This is going to be slowing down the animation because it's going to perform each of these loops very, very quickly. The next thing we're going to need to do is just simply update the ball's position. And this we're just using really a kinematics equation. X equals X initial plus v initial t plus times t plus one half a t squared. So really encoding would be ball dot pause. Uh, and we're going to do this along both x, y, and z. Ball dot pause equals um, r zero, that's x zero, y zero, and z zero, plus v uh, zero uh, times t plus half times a times t times t, that's t squared. So this is going to be essentially updating the position of the ball. And the last thing we need to do is we have to increment time. So because we're starting at time t equals 0, but we have to take that and add dt. So we're going to go 
0, then 0 0.01, then 0 0.02, 0 0.03, and continue onwards until the ball comes back to a height of 0. So if we run it, and hopefully I don't have any errors, we should see the ball moving around through the air. All right, there it is. There's the first ball, and it should end just before it hits the ground. That's it. Okay, so let's go back to editing the program. And now I want to show you how we can take the second ball, that's ball two here, and how we can make it move using a different technique called Euler's method. So I've added a little bit of comments here. So this first, these two lines are just simply moving the ball using, uh, updating the position using basically a kinematics equation. And so now we're going to be taking the second ball and using, making its position change using a numerical integration method. Now Euler's method is the most basic uh, numerical integration method. There are more complex methods, but I'll first start off with this. And as you get more and more comfortable with this, then you can dive into deeper levels of it. So let me try to explain uh, this method of Euler's method, uh, maybe through a graphical way. But let's suppose that you have some acceleration graph where the acceleration is some constant value. If you were to consider two little points in time, so I'm going to take this little increment of time. So in between here and here is what I'll call dt. And if you recall, if you take the area under an acceleration versus time graph, you multiply the acceleration by the width of it, dt, you get basically the change in velocity. So if you take a little chunk of time, which we call the time step dt, and you multiply by the area, assume it's in a rectangle, then the area under an acceleration time graph gives you the change in velocity. So you can find the new velocity, uh, v, by taking the original velocity, we'll call that, I don't know, v old, I guess, and then you add in that little chunk of area, a times dt. So if you take the old velocity and you add a little bit of that area, then you get the new velocity after that time step. So in terms of code, we're simply going to be writing v equals v plus a times dt. And this little a times dt is that little chunk of area, which is represents the change in velocity. Okay, so now if we then plot, let's say, the velocity versus time graph, and let's say that the velocity looks something like that, and then we take the same interval of time. And we're going to, even though this area looks like a trapezoid, it is actually indeed a trapezoid, we're just going to assume that it's a rectangle. So this rectangle will have a width of dt, and it will have a height of v. And again, if you take the area of that, which is v times dt, and if you recall from our earlier lessons, the area under a velocity versus time graph represents the displacement. And to get the new position using that, we can say that the x is equal to the old position that we have plus that little chunk of area, which represents the displacement. And that little chunk of area would be v times dt. So what would that look like in terms of the code? So in terms of the code, uh, it's simply ball.pause, which represents the position of the ball, that attribute of the ball, is the original position plus that little chunk of area right in here. So this is the area of that graph. Now, you might be looking at this and say, well, it's not an exact solution. It's not giving you very accurate because you're approximating this trapezoid to be a rectangle. But you'll see the difference between the solutions and why we might use this method. So let's put this in practice and put this into the code now. Okay, so we're back at the code now, and so we're going to add in a line in the code here, line 24, and we're going to update the ball's uh, position. So I'll write ball.pause, that attribute, equals ball.pause uh, plus uh, v times dt. Now I do have to update the velocity. Either I can do that now, or actually I guess we're going to use the original velocity, so I'll put this line first. Then we'll now update the velocity for the next iteration. So v is equal to v plus a times dt. Now you might notice that I've got a little error. No, I don't actually, fortunately. I have defined a v and a v initial. So the v initial was my original velocity. 
I've also assigned it to be the final velocity at the beginning. Um, but I'm just going to be simply updating this velocity. This is kind of like velocity 2 of the second ball that I keep updating. So by the way, I'm not doing the first ball. I should be doing it for the second ball so we can see the differences. So ball 2, position. So now if I run this program, hopefully I haven't made any mistakes, I should see two balls both moving through the air. All right, there's the red ball, which represents the Euler method, and the blue ball is our analytical solution, which is uh, using just the kinematics equation. Now, you might be wondering, well, it looks pretty much the same. Well, why don't we just start with the second method right off the bat? I mean, that works, right? Well, let me just show you where it might actually fall apart a little bit, because really, actually, this Euler's method is kind of a shabby way, because you're kind of approximating trapezoids to be basically rectangles. If you were to change, say, dt to just say 0.1, now we're going to make the rate then consequently 10. All right, so now we're doing larger increments. It's not 0.01 seconds, it's now 0.1 second. So now if I run the program, you might see some little differences in the two programs. The red ball is now going higher. They're not actually not the same solution now, right? And so you actually get little variations in the solutions. So we could look at those numbers. Um, take a look now if you change this back to, but let's make it even more accurate. If we go 0.001 and make that rate say a thousand, well, the program's going to run a little slower because it's doing more iterations. But as you can see this, these solutions are almost perfectly the same thing. So essentially what I'm trying to say is that the Euler method is very accurate if you make your increment of time, your time step, very, very, very small. Um, now, you might be wondering, why are we using this Euler-Cromer method? Well, you see here, it was a nice solution because the acceleration was constant, and so we can use our regular kinematics equations. So to kind of rehash, the way we did it before is we updated the velocity simply using v equals v0 plus a times t. All right, and then we updated the position just using our kinematics equation x equals x0, then v sub 0 t plus a half times a t squared. All right, but now the way we're doing it is we're updating the velocity by taking the original velocity and adding a times that little increment of dt, a times dt. That gives you that area. And then we're updating the position of the object, taking the original position, and then multiplying by that new velocity times dt. So you're basically kind of working backwards. You're taking the area under an acceleration time graph to get the velocity, and then you're taking the area under a velocity time graph to get the position. And this is basically what we call a numerical integration method. All right. The problem with the Euler method is that if dt is too large, then it's not very accurate. So you have to make dt smaller. But the, one of the great things about the other Cromer method is that if you have a situation, for example, with air resistance and the acceleration is, say, changing as a function of time, well, you can't use the analytical method because this is assuming that the acceleration here is constant. It's always assuming you have some constant value, whereas the Euler-Cromer method would accommodate for the factor of changing acceleration as a function of time or as it changes over at specific points uh, while it's moving, the acceleration may change, and therefore you can use this numerical integration method. Okay, um, I think I've hopefully explained enough to you. Uh, in class, we may talk a little bit more about deeper ways to how to improve this method, uh, because we're really taking the area of really a small rectangle and approximating it. There are better ways of doing this. We could use a midpoint of that interval. You could also use actually make it a trapezoid. So these are our further techniques. And if you're in calculus, you might have heard of the trapezoidal rule. Uh, but I'll leave that for another lesson. Hopefully you have uh, understand what I'm talking about today. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask me.